Okay, uh, welcome everyone to our uh, third uh, uh, talk from the series of Corona Talks. It's not connected to the Corona itself, rather it's just uh, uh, using this name because we have to document this uh, uh, critical moment of the history of humanity. I am Omar Mohammed, uh, a historian originally from Mosul, uh, also known as uh, the founder of uh, Mosul I. I am now living in my exile in France. Uh, I teach history at uh, uh, Sciences Po. Um, today, our guest is uh, Vim Ghavin, or as he calls himself in Arabic, Ghurab al Bain. Those who know Arabic, they will know what Ghurab al Bain means, but he will explain this later. <laughs> he, he received his uh, PhD in 1989 in Arabic studies from the University of Leiden and uh, taught at the Free University of Amsterdam, Frankfurt University, and was a lecturer at the Center of Near and Middle East Studies at University of Marburg, where I actually met with him in June 2018. He also worked uh, on Hadith and Early Islam. He edited with uh, Anna Aksoy, a very important book in uh, titled uh, published by Brill uh, uh, titled Islamic Thought in the Middle Ages which was a studies in text transmission and translation in honor of Hans Dyber. Um, the uh, uh, interesting thing um, also about uh, Wim Raven is that he uh, uh, probably one among a few who still call himself after probably you know the book was published by Edward Said he still call himself an Orientalist, and this was really surprising to me because I have met with many uh, 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 Arabists or Orientalists who actually prefer not to use the uh, uh, title Orientalist. And one of them, probably uh, uh, Professor Arthur Goldschmidt, he always uh, makes sure that he is uh, called uh, 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 a historian, although I still consider him an Orientalist. And this is this is important for us to understand why uh, 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 Orientalist or Orientalism is such a, in somehow, a dangerous uh, term to be used. Um, I will give the floor to uh, 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 Bim Gavin to speak more about this. And my question is, first, I would like to thank you to join us today. Um, my question is, we always miss the beginnings of Orientalism, and we don't know or we do rarely uh, uh, hear Orientalists themselves speaking about Orientalism or how do they define Orientalism, not the Orient, rather the Orientalism itself. Thank you. Yes. Um, when I started my studies, I did not uh, decide to become an Orientalist, and I think no student will. Uh, what you do is you choose uh, Arabic or Chinese or Persian or something like that, or perhaps uh, Islam. Um, then you go to the university, and there is a, an impressive door, and it's, it's written on it, Institute of Oriental Studies or Center of Oriental something, and there you enter. And after six years or even longer, you come out and then you are an Orientalist. But I didn't choose explicitly to become an Orientalist. Yeah, uh, uh, we, we always think of, also we always think of the Orientalism that is only addressing Orient. And the Orient here is the Levant or the Middle East. Uh, 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 mostly, uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the memory of the people or as a reflection to Orientalism, they think that it's only limited to uh, this geographical area. But your experience was different. My first interest was Indonesia, and that is, of course, uh, not in the Near East, but uh, it's also Orient. And I think the Orient in the old uh, definition is uh, also comprising China and even Japan, Korea. Mongolia, perhaps. Well, it is a vast uh, area which is not unproblematic. In fact, Orient is not a geographical term, is it? Um, it is more something in the mind of people. Uh, essential for the Orient was the European Turkish border, I think, from the European point of view. The Americans see it even differently. Um, 
well, this uh, Turkish border, uh, which was a very real border, not so much for political reasons, but because, because of the quarantine, even then, um, you had um, the, the, that border uh, moved since 1800 eastwards. Yugoslavia, Greece, we're all Orient, and uh, nowadays they are <laughs> Europe and Romania and Bulgaria. So um, it's, it's quite a, a, a shifting thing. And moreover, would you call, for instance, Singapore, the Orient, such a modern town? Orient is also a thing of being uh, mysterious, old fashioned. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not completely, it's not a, a geographical concept. Therefore, in universities, they don't use the word anymore, but in newspapers and in in general uh, talks, uh, it, the word comes up again. And then the, the final blow to <laughs> Orient it was perhaps given by Edward Said, you know, uh, since then, as you already mentioned, Orientalists uh, hesitate to be called an Orientalists. Yeah. But, but you still, but you still use this title you you still prefer to be well it's not it's not a title it's an epithet i i was already an orientalist before um before edward said wrote his book and i i didn't see any reason to call myself differently i am not ashamed to so um i i also can call myself an arabist of course but um uh, essential for Orientalists is perhaps also that they don't do one thing only. They have uh, two or three subjects and they combine it under the heading Orientalist. Yeah, um, as long I, as it, I, um, I have here, I have here uh, um, your journey in the, in the Orient and your studies myself and this was a great honor to me but um, I think it's important for our guests to hear the story directly from you. Uh, 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 the same story that you told me in Marburg, uh, uh, on, uh, especially on the connection between Netherlands and Indonesia and how this idea of, of Orientalism and the museum you used to visit. Because ah, yes, yes. These, 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 these things are, uh, uh, they seem to be, to be essential to the beginning of anyone who wants uh, to study the, the East. Everybody, every Orientalist will probably have such a story, but you don't hear them mostly. Huh? Uh, in my case, it was, um, well, I was living in Amsterdam. I was perhaps 12 or 13. Um, we were living near the a Tropical Institute, a Tropical Museum, formerly the Colonial Institute. And on Sunday, I like to uh, to go there in the morning. We had to go to the church. I didn't like it very much, but in the afternoon um, I went to that museum because there were were always events, dances or music and something like that, and I enjoyed that very much. And that was my first uh, idea. I thought I want to go to Indonesia because they make such music there. This was a rather dreamy thing, of course, not very realist. Uh, but I was a bit young to think about money and jobs and things. But I had this uh, this desire already, yes. I was fascinated by the Indonesian or the Javanese music, the gamelan. And when I was a bit older, the, the, that same museum had also an Orientalist bookshop. I don't know whether it's still there, but it was quite impressive. And uh, I like to, to look uh, in there. I saw a Javanese dictionary or or some or some strange text editions or so and I found it also fascinating. So that was my my primal impulse perhaps so and uh, it's dreamy of course and why do you do that? Because your your everyday life in my case was not um, not so fine and um, you dream away you know <laughs> into a far away area and, and you also thought later I go there. I didn't come to Indonesia, but I at least I became an Orientalist. Yeah, um, you, you started you started uh, uh, with this impression of Indonesia, but yet you ended up studying Arab and Middle East studies. Yes, um, I, I decided to study Indonesian, but sorry, 
in those days, it was uh, so that uh, to study Indonesia, you had to do Arabic and Sanskrit first, which is quite absurd, but so it was. And I didn't like, as a beginning student, I, I didn't want to move to Leiden, where the Indonesian studies were. So I thought I can already start with Arabic in Amsterdam. And so I did. And uh, that was a program of Semitical studies. Yeah. Uh, also with Hebrew. I, I didn't bother. I, I liked it too. We had it at school already. And um, so I did that uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, then uh, after three years or so, I moved to Leiden indeed. And I also did Indonesian, classical Malay and modern, Malay, modern Indonesian. But I didn't finish it because I, by then I, I rather went on with Arabic. So I became an Arabist. And you had to choose other things, other subjects. And it, I choose um, modern history of the Near East. And um, uh, what else? Well, a lot of Islam, Islamology, I think it's called in English, isn't it? Yes. Islam, yeah. Um. You, you, you started from what uh, uh, people from the Orient themselves call it as the uh, uh, front lines of Orientalism or the castle of Orientalism, which is, which is Leiden University or Amsterdam or, or Netherlands itself in general. Uh, uh, yeah. Yet we didn't see, and also you have Germany close to you, yet we didn't see this uh, in the studies or in the critical studies of Edward Said when he decided to study Orientalism. Uh, did, you, did you have an opinion about this? Why, why, why would you think that Edward Said wouldn't uh, uh, actually uh, uh, touch the uh, 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 German and the uh, uh, Dutch Orientalism? And we know that, for example, you still have, as the, the Egyptian called it, Brill, El Mahrusa, yeah. that, that produced most of the Orientalism studies uh, uh, books and uh, other other uh, uh, edited manuscripts. Yes, uh, even the Encyclopedia of Islam has yeah. appeared at real. Um, well, why didn't uh, Tuar Said? I think it had a, a practical reason because he didn't know uh, Dutch uh, and no German. But it may have or had also another reason. Um, well, Holland would have been a nice example for him. He could have used it if he had known Dutch. Um, but Germany was different, of course, in Oriental studies. Germany had no colonies to begin with, uh, only late in the 19th century. And those uh, German colonies were not in the so-called Orient, or, or with a small exception. And then um, Germany didn't exist yet as a country. Uh, it was a lot of uh, smaller states. And all these states had their own court and their own universities, which uh, made place for a lot of uh, professors. Uh, you, it's always the case. It was in Islamic Spain, the same situation. You, you may remember the Muluk at Tawa'if. Huh? That was the same situation. Um, and the Germans, well, they didn't care for colonies or, or whatever. Um, they were interested in, um, yeah, in, in the Orient. In itself, they were curious. They were they were um, touched by romantic feelings. Uh, they had all always uh, studied. Uh, well, they did study Arabic before, but only as a an auxiliary to theology, to to for a better understanding of the Old Testament, um, because that Hebrew wasn't always so so easy, and. Um, so Syriac and uh, Aramaic and Arabic, they studied for theology. Uh, around 1800, um, German scholars wanted to get rid of that theology on one hand, and on the other hand, they wanted to have a, a, an independent, independent study of, of Oriental subjects parallel to the classical philology. And they did it in the same way as Latin and Greek, uh, old texts, uh, text editions. Uh, you don't have to speak it, uh, but you, you, you look in old texts all the time and you make a text critical apparatus and things like that. Um, that was, um, that was their, their impulse. And of course, they liked also um, poetry, the Arab, the, the ancient poetry, Goethe already. Um, 
admired that. And um, yes, uh, so it was very much uh, out of mere interest, not for any ulterior motive. Later in the 90, late in the 19th century, the, the empire of Germany um, did a bit of colonial, but not much. So uh, Said would never had a point with Germany. It were all nice people sitting in their rooms and study old texts with no colonial intentions. If you see my meaning, um, this is this is a very this is a very interesting point. What you say that he didn't have interest in Germany because Germany didn't have that much history of colonialism. Does that mean that Said, and we we, we read his book many times again and again? Uh, do you think that Said did a damage to Orientalism when he connected it to the colonialism? Uh, yes, I think so. Yes, but on the other hand, I don't. I don't mind um, because um, it was a, a, a kick in the ass. How do you say that decently? Um, the Orientalists um, waked up again once more. Now, in my in my picture there is something black do you still see me yes we still okay. see you. well there is something that peculiar in the in the in the picture never mind um where was i uh yes it was a bit of a, a wake-up call for the orientalists to once more to uh, review their what what they were were doing and uh, the colonial times were over since long by then but i in my uh, study time, um, the, the Indonesian studies, I must say, uh, there was one professor who was quite up to date and modern, also in his teaching method, but others were, uh, for them, uh, the colonial period seemed not to have stopped yet. <laughs> See what I mean? And therefore, um, it was pro probably good that, that, uh, that somebody got angry. Mm. Um, I don't know if you can see the question uh, uh, or not. It's from one of my students uh, from Liz. She is saying where Edward Said describes Orientalism as a lens colored by colonialist past. How are you, we, defining Orientalism in the context of this conversation? Oh, uh, I would say it is a term uh, inherited from the past, which still can be used as an umbrella for the variety of subjects which one studies. I mean, you can also say area studies, of course, which is more modern. Hmm? But uh, some institutes are still called Oriental Studies or Center of Oriental Studies. And uh, why not? I mean, it's not nothing to be ashamed of. In, uh, hmm? yeah. uh, it's, well, uh, I, I would like, I would like to, um, to give our uh, attendees the chance to also ask their questions. Uh, if you have any question, please just unmute yourself and start speaking to uh, Wim Raven. I'm waiting for other people to ask another question because I'm itching to ask a question. You, you, can, you, can, you can ask, please, you can ask. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, this is actually a conversation that I was having with someone else before jumping onto this call. Um, because I'm, I'm a global peace and conflict studies major, and I've chosen my area of emphasis as Europe and Russia. However, for a really long time, I had a specific interest within the Middle East and North Africa. Mm -hmm. However, French and Spanish are much easier than Arabic <laughs> to learn. But where is it or how is it that you navigate your studies um, in terms of not simply following it, falling into romanticizing a culture, or you mentioned that the, your first interest to study Orientalism was sparked by a museum as you were a child, but how is it that you approach the subject so you're not simply someone coming in and imposing your views instead of being someone coming in and understanding it from the inside? Well, when I did my studies, of course, the most uh, the program was more or less um, offered ready-made because you couldn't you could do everything. You had to take whatever was what was there, you know. 
So that was uh, more or less uh, the direction. And then in, uh, when I was in Leiden, there was also the, the fixed program was uh, to go to Egypt to, for further studies. And also I, that, that's what I did as well. And I didn't have such a such a navigation. In fact, I, I just did what I. This may sound a bit luxurious, but so it was in the sixties. You there was time, there was money. Everyone did what he liked, <laughs> and without um, further uh, program. In the certainty that as an academic you would get a job, you know that it was like that in those days. But how do you, in doing what you like, how is it that you avoid kind of this dynamic that tends to, there tends to be with anthropologists, so to speak, where people come in and study a country and those people coming in to study that country are usually white men, but the people that they're studying are not. Yeah, um, I'm not sure whether I understood your question completely. Well, the white men, I was a white man in Egypt, of course. Um, by then, uh, that was uh, 1971, 72, yes. Uh, I was a, a white young man. Um, what struck me by then was um, that they almost revered white young men. I, I was an example for, the, for my fellow students, and I don't know why, but uh, because I was immature. <laughs> I was, uh, well, I smoked a pipe, for instance, so all the other boys also wanted a pipe, and I had a... Um, what do you call it? A calendar. I wrote my appointments in, in the, and so they bought also one. And and I found a general reverence. Uh, um, they respected me as if I were a big, a big uh, lord or so, uh, which was not appropriate because the country had sent away the English, and so so this was a bit late. Uh, <laughs> to have such colonial feelings. I didn't have them, they had them. But later, of course, they, um, they didn't have them anymore. So, and then I got also uh, to feel that I was a white man and I was not always liked as such. Hmm? Yeah, was that about your question? Or? Yeah, I think it, my question was more along the terms of how to navigate this space without, um, I think controlling the narrative. It's just when you, when I feel like you study uh, some of these cultures, especially cultures that come from a space that is not Western and not um, traditionally Western or European, those spaces can be interesting to navigate, especially when you're coming in and you're studying that space. And I think when I took an ethnic studies class, um, one of the things that we talk about is how anthropologists can sometimes come in and have this bird's eye view where they're looking at something from the top down. Instead of being able to understand it for what it is, they understand it through their own lens. Yes, um, I must say, the Oriental studies as I have known them was uh, mainly philology. And uh, we knew about anthropology, but it was that was another world, as it were. Later on, I understood, of course, that it would have been useful <laughs> to uh, take a bit of that as well. And you can also have um, history, for instance, or uh, or so many other subjects which we didn't do. Uh, we were mainly philologists. I was in language and literature, and later on, I had to do quite a lot of Islam because the student wanted that. Um, I didn't like it, but I tried to um, treat the biography of the prophet as literature. And um, anthropology, no, the, I, I didn't have any. And I, see, I was uh, quite as naive as my predecessors 100 years ago, I think, in this, in this respect. That has changed, of course. Uh, these days, uh, you can have anthropology, you can have political science, you can have... Uh, economics even, <laughs> whatever, um, in connection with your oriental. Uh, yeah, um, I, would like, I would like to give Dr. G the uh, opportunity to share his opinion with us because he uh, mentioned a book that is well known uh, 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 by, by Zakari Lukman uh, about oriental and Middle East studies. Uh, Professor Goldschmidt, do you hear me? You, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I, I went and looked for it. Um, 
Dr. Raven, and this is the book I'm talking about. It was published twice, once in about uh, 2002, again in 2010. It's a, a history of Orientalism, which carefully spells out what Oriental studies were like in Europe. I believe it was France that probably pioneered in Oriental studies, although we also um, owe a great deal to uh, the Dutch. I'm sorry, I, I, I have difficulty in hearing you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, let me try again. Um, I have recently bought and read a book on the history of Orientalism. Yeah, yes, I got if that. If you don't know it, I would certainly recommend it to you. Uh, Your okay. English is very good, so I think you could handle it. Yes. Zachary Lockman's book, Contending Visions of the Middle East. I've written it out. That one. Fine. Um, it appears that Orientalism uh, began really in France and uh, then subsequently in the Netherlands and in, in England, um, partly because of the economic need to trade uh, with Muslim countries and partly because of the development, as you yourself pointed out, of biblical studies uh, to make people more aware of their need for Arabic. Uh, it's really only in the United States that we commonly use the term Orient to refer to China and Japan. Uh, in Europe, from what I can understand, we tend to use Orient more commonly when we're talking about what we, the rest of us call the Middle East. Yeah. But the current trend, as you have correctly pointed out, has been more toward uh, discipline, ac established academic disciplines such as anthropology, sociology, political science, economics. Uh, in my case, it was history. Uh, but we still have to spend an awful lot of time just learning the language. And so for many of us, it seems as if we're Orientalists because so much of our attention is drawn to language and literature, which is, of course, traditionally what Orientalists did. Um, but I think Lockman's book explains this all a little bit more coherently than the two. Uh, breath, so. uh, 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 sorry, it's not your voice, it's the, uh, uh, the line, which is not very clear. But I, I, I think I got most of you. Um, indeed, uh, I also read a book about uh, Orientalism in Germany, a, a thick one, as you could expect, um, but I don't know the other one, but I, I, would, I would like to read it once, yes. And as for the motives of the Dutch, of course they were colonial. The, the people studied Islamic law to govern their colonies better, but it was not only that, uh, there were also uh, more the German type of scholars in Holland who like to sit at home with a nice old book and edit a text and without any connection with with um, with whatever colonial and there was of course a school in Holland uh, I think 1864 or so um, when I remember right uh, a school of uh, civil administration for the Indies where the civil servants were uh, schooled and the, of course they had also to learn a language unfortunately they started with javanese which is quite difficult <laughs> uh, later on it became malay um, but they had to learn uh, everything a, a package of things uh, a bit of geography a bit of law um, also what we now would call anthropology uh, by then it was of course called uh, Volkenkunde, uh, Ethnology, probably, yes, uh, and all in a, in a bit rudimental way, of course, but uh, also belong, it also belongs to it, yes. Um, I, I have a question, if you, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. uh, most of the studies about Orientalism, we see they come from either the Orient or young uh, researchers recently, but we have never had the chance to know about the perception of the Oriental studies in their homelands. For example, the perception of the Netherlands or Holland's Oriental studies. How do the people there pre perceive this? How do they interact with Orientalism? Uh, the readers of Orientalism in, in Netherlands, for example, who are they if, if this is a feasible uh, and possible question to ask? How do they see the Orientalism itself, not the Orient, rather the Orientalism? Yeah, well, <clears throat> in uh, the 19th century, I, I think um, they found it quite all right. Uh, well, uh, the many Orientalists were, of course, gentlemen of leisure with, who brought their own money. Others, um, 
uh, wanted a, a career in the Indies, and that was uh, that was respected. And uh, although sometimes you got the impression that people went to the Indies only because they couldn't land well in Holland itself, uh, but um, yeah, in the um, 20th century, uh, it became the reputation of being uh, a luxury subject and there was not so much money left among the people uh, so it was um, even with scholarships um, people had the, the name, they called it an orchid uh, subject you know a, a, a rare precious flower and uh, moreover the, the oriental studies slept more or less until 1973 uh, it was a bit of a sleepy affair, especially the Indonesian studies, which was only the remains of what had been once in, of interest. But then there was the oil crisis of 1973, and people started to have an interest in the Arabic world, also commercial, uh, but also cultural. There was not directly a hate against Islam, that came later. Um, there was a, a a genuine interest and then um, yeah many books were translated from the Arabic <clears throat> and yeah um, how it was in Germany in those days well there was in in the 19th century there was much respect as much as for the uh, classical philology um, and that remained yes um, <clears throat> at least until the First World War, the Germans played their part in international scholarship. Thereafter, it was, uh, it broke off more or less because Germany went through a, an economic crisis and also uh, because it had lost the war and was not so beloved anymore. Um, and the same applied, of course, to the Second World War. But uh, in the 50s and the 60s, well, German, Orientalism came up again, and it had still the uh, the solid quality of before. It was only, yeah, uh, people said it's a luxury. It's a luxury. It's not really necessary. But I would say in these days it changed again. Everybody sees how important the Near East is for our countries. So uh, people. Uh, students come in flocks and uh, yes they also want to understand the islam which has become a, a problem <laughs> more or less and uh, many uh, cities in germany i know have uh, their islam uh, civil servants who work on islam to for the contact with the immigrants and things like that so it is quite uh, and we have even had we have even had spies <laughs> Uh, students who wanted to become a spy. Uh, that was already the case in the 60s, but then it was, uh, nobody talked about it, it was hush hush, but now they are quite um, quite open about it. Yeah. yeah uh, 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 go ahead, Mr. Ambassador, you, you, you wanted to ask a question. Yeah, Omar, uh, thank, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, webinar. I'm not an academic at all, um, I'm a diplomat, um, uh, but uh, very interested to 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 listen to your uh, to your uh, talks, uh, Professor. We don't know each other, even though we're countrymen, but uh, yes. still very interesting here. Um, I just wanted to throw in a thought that um, Orientalism, the way you present it, and maybe some others on the screen as well, is is from a rather per, uh, academic point of view. I, although I do not carry the name Orientalist on my business card, certainly not. I do feel a certain warmth to the term and um, I, I am part of a community, let's say, in my country of diplomats, academics, journalists, etc., who all share a certain love perhaps for a part of the world, not only to look at it through rosy glasses, of course, They're also very much seeing what's not good there, but sharing a certain uh, fascination for that part of, of the world is also what binds me to the subject. Of course. Um, and, and, and that is something that drives me also, and even in the way I choose my next postings. My next posting happens to be Ambassador to Baghdad, but oh, the one yeah. after that will also be something similar because ah. it is something that fascinates me. Yes, but uh, well, uh, you wouldn't call it Orientalist, probably you would speak of Middle Eastern, Near Eastern studies or, or something like that. Or? 
Or would well, I, 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 I really uh, don't think I should mention the way we call it within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but no, we no. don't use the term Orientalism. We call it Middle East Mafia, but we yeah. do all know each other. Yeah, <laughs> That's of course, it is, it is a relatively small world and uh, yeah, yeah, you know each other. And uh, well, that is helpful also for the uh, Orientalist of my type. I mean, I, can, I cannot do so many things because I have no idea about history, economics, uh, and things like that. And then we, by talking and being in contact with each other, you, you, can, um, you can become a bit wiser. And, uh, and you may need one day people who know the language or, or yeah. So it, 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 will be a, it, it will be a club, yes, it, it is. It is a club. In Germany, they have a, a magazine of such a club, it's called Zenit. Um, yes, it's really a, a Near Eastern community, so to speak, and uh, it's quite a good, good magazine. When you have become an ambassador, you should put it on your coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, Rabbi Asa, you you have a question, I think. Yeah, I asked it in the comments. I said, uh, what are your views on the discussion of the placement of Russia and whether in its uh, in the Oriental studies, whether its placement is in the Occident or in the Orient? Oh, well, Russian Oriental studies in the old days, uh, we didn't hear much about it. It, it existed even uh, in the pre-revolutionary times, uh, but there was, well, I know only one Arabist from Russia, he was quite good, but there were more. Um, Russia was, it was and is interesting and important, of course, for studies about Persia, Central Asia and things. Uh, a bit less for the Arabic world, I would say. And of course, the problem was we, uh, first, we didn't get all their stuff. And secondly, we couldn't read it when it was in Russian. Um, but when you when you are a specialist for Persia, you have to learn R Russian because it is so much uh, there's so much secondary literature. You have to do it. Uh, but you can study Arabic quite well without Russia, as, as it were. I know that Russia has struggled over the centuries to acquire a Western character. What what can you do? A Western character. A verse. Ah, so you mean uh, uh, how, in, in what respect they are Oriental? Um, yeah, nah. I, I would count them to the West, <laughs> but uh, who am I? Well, there are, of course, uh, I think the country has 40 million Muslims in its uh, borders, uh, and there are some people, uh, yeah, that brings us to the to the question again, what is Oriental and, and who is Oriental? I mean, in Petersburg, you have no Oriental, but then you, then you hear Rahmaninov and, and you think, oh, a Muslim or his grandfather, perhaps. Um, well, but and, Rabbi, um, actually, your question is more about whether Russia is part of the West or not. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Well, who am I to? And my, my feeling is, yes, of course, it belongs to the West. The same question you might ask about Turkey. Um, Turkey was, that, of course, traditionally very Oriental, but uh, in, in modern times, when I come to Turkey, I, I don't have the impression it is Oriental. Let, us, let me put it like that. <laughs> I, um, at my uh, present job, I'm deputy ambassador to NATO, uh, Rabbi, oh. and we have this discussion, of course, a lot about Russia. And yeah. interestingly enough, uh, very much because of the present push by the Trump administration to try to refocus on China. And um, one of the things that once, of course, this is offline and it doesn't happen in official communications, but we had some discussions amongst colleagues whether in the end, and it's an interesting philosophical question, in the end, if NATO or the European community of NATO, let's say, is truly based on our you know, values, our culture, etc., do not, uh, Moliere, Shakespeare, uh, Goethe, Schiller, and Fondel, if you like to put a Dutch one in, have more in common with Dostoevsky and Tolstoy than we do collectively with Tao and Confucius. And that becomes a really interesting debate. Yes, uh, that, that's and oriental. If you then look at you know, the Americans, especially yeah. this, this government, 
refocusing on the pivot to the east, as it's called. Yeah. Said, well, the real next battle will be with the Chinese. Maybe yes. we should sort out our troubles with the Russians quickly and then focus on the real thing. Yes, I, I'm not. Uh, I didn't think about these things professionally, but just as a, as a person, I, I am always I'm also under the impression that Russia is coming nearer to us or the other way around. Uh, and I would, yes, uh, not enthusiast, but I would, uh, because of the present government, but I would, I would reckon it to the West, yes, uh, I think, no problem. But even, when, even within the West, when we're discussing Russia and we're discussing, you mentioned Dostoevsky, and I feel like Dostoevsky is a particular person to mention, because why not mention like Kirevsky or Tadaev or like these other people? And so when you're looking at the conceptualization of identity, the conceptualization of identity within Russia is very starkly different to the conceptualization of identity through the West, uh, to the West, rest of the Western world. Is it? Um, I don't know about it, but uh, it may be that those, those uh, famous writers, they were, of course, a layer somewhere uh, up, up in the society, and there may be a, a large uh, substratum of, I don't know. Um, I, when I meet Russians, and I didn't meet many of them, I have no problem with recognizing them as one of my kind. I mean... Uh, no, I mean, I'm not saying that, like, there's this like stark separation where we, you cannot diplomatically interact with them. I'm saying that when you're trying to look at, you know, where to head with diplomacy or where to head with policy, it's important not to be too quick to place something in one or the other. They themselves have, you know, come up with this idea of Eurasianism for example, right, with this, yeah. this own special way. And I think that that comes from their conceptualizations of identity, which are very, very rooted in the Russian Orthodox Church. And one of the writers that I mentioned is a writer that talks about this special identity in this special way and where you can find that identity is within the peasantry of Russia and not necessarily in the upper echelons. And yeah. so I feel like, there's a separation within society when it, uh, not to, I'll stop talking because I feel <laughs> Yes. Um, well, the same question might arise already in Greece or Bulgaria. Is it still the West or is it the West? Um, well, one has to, un to distinguish, of course, uh, do you mean the West as a, as a military bloc uh, from the NATO point of view or is it an enemy? Uh, that is different, of course, but culturally, I think, one might with some with some effort. Uh, I, I spent time in Greece. I had some effort there already. Uh, to uh, some difficult there to uh, to get warm with them or to feel them as mine. Uh, but it uh, it succeeded, and I think I, I would in Russia as well. Uh, but uh, I don't know really. I don't know that country, and it is so big. Uh, I asked the question because um, you probably heard the phrase. You know, East is East. Uh, West, that West, and that Russia is sometimes put into the East, you know, in terms of uh, political values or... Well, then, then we might ask the question again, where does the Orient start? Uh, political values and Hungary or Poland could all... <laughs> are, are they still Western? And, and moreover, what is the West? In, in the meantime, it's crumbling as we speak, and, and the Western values, uh, that there's not much left of them. Uh, so I wouldn't be there too supercilious in these fields. <laughs> we take it as it comes, I mean. Yeah, uh, if, if, if I may comment on this, and it's also a question, didn't the question of Orient or East and West began with what was Europe and what was Greece? Uh, oh, no, I don't think so. You mean the uh, Thermopylae and things like that, uh, yeah. the Persian Empire? No, I don't think so. I cannot talk with authority because I, I'm not a classical philologist, but I heard it from my colleagues from that field that that is really nonsense. Um, in the meantime, um, the, uh, the Greek culture has been uh, uh, praised uh, as... Uh, as the, the cradle of Western culture, yes, uh, maybe it was, but 
uh, the Greek culture was so full of oriental stuff from Babylonia and things like that in the old days, I mean, uh, uh, I think in those days you could not have this uh, frontier between the two, between Persia and Greece. It were enemies, of course, but I don't think the, the cultural difference was that enormous, no? Yes. Um. We, we have Annika who said that Catherine the Great was German and... Yes, she was. <laughs> and Peter the Great studied in Holland. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Did, did you want to say something, Annika? Yes, I, I, I do. I see the problem as partly one of defining what is us and what is them. And yes. the way we teach the history of Western civilization, typically we start with the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Mesopotamians, I just say, Omar's ancestors, we yeah. treat them as part of us. We treat Greece as part of us. Yeah, but, but in many uh, ways, we would feel very alien if we were to actually be transported back to ancient Mesopotamia or to ancient Greece or even to ancient Rome, because it's really the sense of an idea of Western civilization that developed over a very long period of time, and yes. in which historians have chosen to define certain areas as Western, certain not. Um, I think in Metternich's expression, Asia begins at the Landstrasse, suggesting that the Balkans aren't really Western. Um, Russia had to go to considerable effort to make itself accepted as a Western a country in the time of Peter the Great and, of course, Catherine, who I agree was German. Uh, it's, um, it's kind of a mixed bag. And now, of course, there are all sorts of ways in which we can view the world. After all, some of the most interesting things that are going on in literature in English literature actually occur in India. Um, yeah. Because the Indians often write their novels in English. Um, but an awful lot of this is how we conceptualize us and them. And uh, what Edward Said is particularly talking about is the othering of certain people. The othering. I wanted to say that uh, that, that is uh, essential in Orientalism. The, they are the others. But they uh, must not remain the others. I mean, the, the peoples of the Balkans are not so other anymore. And the Japanese, uh, they, they play Bach like, <laughs> like any German. I mean, and, and, and we ourselves, uh, we, we, one doesn't, we are not the same. And the beginning of civilization in the 19th century uh, in Europe, uh, it was no doubt uh, supposed to be Greece. Um, but uh, at the end of the 19th century, they discovered uh, Babylonia and, and ancient, uh, Egypt was already, had already been discovered. So they widened the, 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 the concept of what is us, but it was uh, much smaller in the beginning, wasn't it? And in the medieval times, uh, these um, Western Latin Christians, they didn't consider the Oriental Church as them. No, they were, they were Orient. <laughs> Uh, maybe there it started with the term of Orient. The Oriental Church was even worse than uh, the uh, than the false prophet, as you see my meaning. Um, so uh, the boundaries, the frontiers, still are moving, and and we should be aware, perhaps, that East and West are in our mind, not in in any other reality. Yeah. Uh we, 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 often, we often discuss Orientalism in kind of like, this is in general in, 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 in many like Middle Eastern uh, uh, institutes in the Middle East itself, we often discuss Orientalism as a negative uh, 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 term and we have probably discussed this earlier. But how many people know about, for example, Anne, Anne Marie Schimmel, the mother of the Sufism studies? and the rule of, of Noldica and the rule of other Orientalists who actually preserve, or can we say that they preserve the Islamic heritage and the Islamic history as well as the theology itself? Of course they did, and uh, they are appreciated, which you can see in the number of illegal reprints of their works that are made in the Near Eastern countries. Uh, so they are gladly taken. I was once, uh, I, I was the victim myself uh, with a publication and it turned out that they had printed 9,000 copies of my thing, uh, which was never reached in Europe, of course. <laughs> and so um, 
I thought, well, okay, no money, but it's good that they read it. Uh, and um, yeah, um, uh, where were we? <laughs> what yeah. was the other point? With, with, with Anne-Marie Anne -Marie Schimmel and the... Story. Oh yeah, Anne-Marie Schimmel. Yes, I think she is known in uh, Pakistan. She was almost uh, revered hmm? uh, when she was still alive. Uh, so um, yes, uh, and so th there were some others. Um, th there were also ugly persons who had double life or were only uh, working for colonial powers, but... Like one period, for example? Like Vampiri? Like who? Vampiri. Vampiri? Va Vampiri. Vampiri and Goldsiha. No, I don't know him. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, since, since you spoke about, about some, some bad Orientalists, Goldsiha said that every word Vampiri said was a lie. And we, we, can, we can see this kind of conversations between Orientalists themselves and that they, they, are, they criticize each other. Uh -huh. uh, 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 with with the rise with the rise of terrorism and I, I would like I would like to close with this and with with your with your thoughts uh, of what is the possible future of Orientalism studies with the rise of the terrorism in the Middle East and with the rise of all of this a kind of extremism do you think the need for Orientalism is much bigger now than before I would say the the uh... The need is bigger than before, uh, and it has also become easier to learn, uh, for instance, Arabic. Uh, uh, in the old days, the, uh, the teachers were bad and the textbooks were miserable. Nowadays, we have good teachers, we have good um, means of uh, learning, uh, methods of learning. Uh, so that will continue, and even more so, because there are many people of uh, Arabic descent, of or half Arabic descent in Europe, for instance, who will continue with that. But I uh, don't think it will run under the name Orientalism. It will be area studies or uh, Arabic or whatever, or, or a real. Uh, well, it was always a problem in Holland, in, uh, not in Holland, in Orientalism, that you have, uh, you, you knew a bit about history, yes. You, you studied history, but you were not an historian because that is a separate discipline, you know. And um, I wasn't, and I am not a lawyer, but I, or or I didn't uh, study law. Uh, but of course, we had to know something about Islamic law, quite a lot. But never with, we, I was never <laughs> a, a, a law student, and I think that will be more um, separated and specialized in future. And the language will be there for everyone who wants to learn it, and it's not that exclusive anymore as. As in the old days, so you can type Arabic on your on your home computer these days. Yeah, that's that's. Um, we we see we see how also there is this kind of question that is always on my mind is that we we often see now more Orientals themselves producing Orientalism uh, studies. Yes, of course. Plus but to call someone who is originally from the Orient, who have the same discipline or the same studies and receive the same education as an Orientalist, can yeah. you also call him an Orientalist? I wouldn't do that. But I think most of these people are in America, not so many in, in Europe, although there are some. But um, in America, there are quite a lot. Uh, but I think one wouldn't... One wouldn't call them oriental, or they wouldn't call themselves orientalists, I guess. And and does it matter how, uh, when they just get their knowledge, it doesn't matter so much what it is called, is it? Yeah, um, one of them actually, there is there is there is an example that he actually called himself an Arabist. Uh, he is the Iran researcher, the Iranian researcher Hassan Ansari, who works with uh, Zabina Schmidtka. Uh, an Arabist, you said. Yeah. He calls himself yes. An yes, that's of course completely correct. I could call myself an Arabist, and I did it sometimes. But I did also a lot of on Islam, so I'm I have two subjects, so to speak, uh, and um, and then not the Indonesian. So, uh, but if you want to focus on one subject, of course, you are an Arabist or a Persianist or a Sanskritist or whatever. Yes. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, I, I will not. I will not take more time from you. But uh, uh, I would like to hear your 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 thoughts on, as we say, the future of Orientalism, and the future of its role in the connection or relation between East and West. Um, you mean the attitude of Orientalism? Yes. Yes, that is, of course, it shouldn't be there anymore, but it still is, unfortunately. Uh, I, I recently, I found an example in the, um, well, this corona thing. It seems to be so that uh, South Korea uh, is doing the best uh, to, fight, to fight corona. Um, this was, of course, um, uh, this led to the question in Holland, for instance, shouldn't we do like the South Koreans do? Wouldn't be that the best method to fight Corona? No, was the answer. Um, we cannot do that. We, are, we love freedom and the Koreans are uh, much more uh, obedient and submissive and naturally inclined to collectivism. You see, that is... That is a little fragment of Orientalism that is still there, <laughs> and which is it should be uh, <laughs> should be banned from our thought. I think uh, th this idea that they are they are Oriental, for heaven's sake. <laughs> I have never been to Korea, but I I bet it will be a lot of more modern country than Germany. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, rich discussion. Thank you all the attendees and a special thank to Professor Goldschmidt, to Mr. Ambassador and to Rabbi uh, uh, Asa and also to my students. Uh, uh, two of them, they were always asking great questions. Uh, they are still here, three of them. I am proud that they are here. Thanks. Thank you, Annika. Elisabetta, thank you for joining us too. Uh, uh, we will have uh, next week another discussion, but it's not about Orientalism. It's more about the uh, European Union rule in the post-ISIS uh, 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 Iraq, especially uh, on Mosul. We will host one from the external office of the European Union, uh, Rafaela Idiochi. She is going to discuss the EU rule after the fall of Mosul and after the liberation of uh, uh, Mosul. And we will also touch the base about uh, Syria and the future role of EU in Syria. Thank you, Gurab al -Bain. We didn't speak about the, the name and why you did choose this. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know if you can, if you can just mention a note about this. Uh, yes, the Gurab is, of course, the translation of my name, Raven, uh, and Gurab al -Bain, the, the, the uh, raven of separation, is a topos in uh, ancient uh, Arabic poetry. The, the black bird uh, is a, a harbinger of separation and of evil in general. It is about uh, love, um, beloved ones who have to s split up because their caravans go into other directions, you know. And that, and then there is this raven who, well, it, it, I just choose it because when you start a blog and you, I want to, to do my own name, but it was already taken, so I, <laughs> I thought of something else. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I will close with this final note from the uh, uh, from Mr. Ambassador. He say, I think Orientalism is here to stay, whether we call it like that or not. Maybe 20 years from now, the term will be reinvented again. The main thing is the correcting we have to the region. Yeah, yeah okay. Thank That's you all very much. I, I, I regret that I cannot know you personally, but it's like, it's how it is, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Stay safe and, and bye keep bye. the distance. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.